Thank you, Dave. All right, uh, everybody can hear me. We're good. Oh, a uh, a clicker. This is cool. Uh, so hi, welcome for uh, welcome to my talk. Thank you for coming. This is exciting. I I gave a talk last at the first SuperCon, so it's cool to be uh, back on the stage. Uh, we're talking about uh, the circuit graver. Let me get orientation on this right. Yes, so we're uh, talking about making high-feature circuit boards at home. Um, and when I say high-feature circuit boards, I'm specifically talking about the minimum feature size you can get to. So um, this is a circuit board that I made like two weeks ago uh, using the machine we're going to talk about. Um, and it's uh, hosting a 0.5 millimeter pitch DFN shift register and some 0.5 millimeter pitch resistor networks and some 0402 LEDs. Um, and I made it two weeks ago in my, uh, in my apartment, which I think is cool. Um, and I have it here. Um, and then these are the other two boards that I've made using the machine. So three so far. This is very new. Um, and here's the machine in action. So uh, it's like a tiny shaper. Um, it uses a lathe bit, and it carves circuit boards. So it's like it's not a mill. It doesn't have a spinny thing. It just kind of pushes little chips out of the way. It's really fun. <laughs> so um, I think what's notable here is you can see I'm, I'm carving the landing pads for the ESP32 Zhao board that's going to control the shift register. Um, but I'm doing it after I've installed and tested the shift register on the first board I ever made two weeks ago. Uh, so this is a high-risk operation. Um, you know, and I did it for you guys. So I thought that was kind of fun. <laughs> um, and that's about it. You know, so it, uh, it's fast. You know, when you mill circuit boards, it goes two or three millimeters a second. This is like 10 times that. So it's, uh, it's a very productive machine. Um, and it's fast and quiet and tiny open source and all the rest. Um, so Dave, Dave mentioned this um, in my day job. I work at a nonprofit in Boston called The Possible Zone. Like I teach students how to make circuit boards and how to solder them and like how to run CNC machines and like all the rest of it. I'm a senior technician, um, and I have a fleet of lovely little mills. And like this is from the summer. I did a I did a workshop on dance and electronics, um, and like I was designing the board the night before. And like when you do that. You know, then you can just mill the boards and have them ready the next day, which is really fabulous. Um, but of course, with circuit board milling, you know, you're really restricted in the components you can use. Um, so I say like SOICs and dips are pretty accessible, but anything smaller than that is kind of it's kind of difficult. Um, and you can see like how slow the actual milling cutter runs. Like it is working, but it's working really slowly. It's making dust. It's making noise. Uh, it's just not very pleasant. Um, and of course, if you ask Cedric, he'll say, use a fiber laser. And he's right. Fiber lasers are sweet. Um, there's other ways to do this. Um, there's also conductive ink. You know, there's ferric chloride and etching at home. Um, so think of this as just a new way of doing it, just a different way of doing it, not necessarily a better way of doing it. Um, so this is from a talk I gave in 2017 that uh, Todd saw. Um, so this is how I used to do it. I would do it manually with an Ulfa box cutter. Um, with like a little finger rest I made, made out of like a, an XT60 connector and all that stuff. Um, and you just like do two 30 degree cuts next to each other and then you lift this cute little chip up, right? Um, so this is before I could afford a mill and like I just needed a way to prototype things fast at home. Um, and these are some of the things I made with, uh, with that method. So there's, um, for my startup, there's like a membrane potential analyzer. Um, there's like this, I, I hacked my Xbox controller in half and like, you know, built little FR4 supports to make a little phone controller. Um, and this is my badge hack from the 2016 Super Conference. Um, but you can see like the, the, um, the rim around the outside is FR4 and I've used that technique to singulate, you know, little conductive nets that I can then make the matrix across. Um, in my like Airbnb at three in the morning, it was, you know, use the machine, like don't do it, don't do it by hand. Um, and like this board up top on the left, was really fun, but it, you know, it took four hours. Like, it's, it's not a trivial process, but it is a very relaxing and a very quiet process, which is kind of neat. Um, so later than that, you know, I wanted to explore a path to automating the method. Um, so I found these lathe tools. They're little carbide inserts. Um, and I found a really fine tip radius version. So it's got a 100 micron tip radius. And if you kind of math it out and you say one ounce copper plus, you know, one X overcut, you can get about a 0.2 millimeter wide trench, you know, which is about eight mil space and trace design rules. Uh, but if you sharpen it and like kind of are not kind to it, you know, you can get down to like four mil theoretical spaces and traces. And I'm like that, that sounds compelling. Like let's, let's, uh, let's get this cutter. Let's build a little fixture that kind of constrains it to a single axis. Let's like try dragging it across the substrate and let's see what kind of results we get. You know, this, let, let's measure it. And, um, yeah, that was the context this, uh, 
this summer when Elliot extended the call for proposals. And it's like, all right, maybe I can like make this into a thing for Hackaday and apply extrinsic motivation to a project I've been working on for eight years and not making progress on. So let's build a test jig, let's constrain the cutter, it's manual, um, you know, let's get some measurements and then like, you know, bundle that up and submit a talk and like if it's accepted, then we, then we build the machine. Um, so this is a test jig that I built um, pretty, pretty quickly. So it's just got MGN7 linear rails, um, you know, and it's got a little cutter, it's got a flexure for the Z axis, um, and then there's actually a, a flexure above it. Let's see, do I have a laser pointer? That's okay. So there's a flexure above the flexure that allows you to adjust the pressure on the cutter. Um, so I played with rake angle and I, I played with sharpness and I played with like speed and like all these different pr parameters, um, just like drawing chips across it. Um, Here's a, here's a successful run. Um, you know, so I got this cute little chip that it makes. Um, and then if you look at it under the, under the loop, um, there's like a white trench. And it's white because you've gotten all the way through the copper. You're doing like proper isolation routing. Um, I, <laughs> I'm so sorry about this picture. Like it, this is a cell phone picture through a loop. You know, so it's not great. But um, in the background, this is like a, a 0.5 millimeter spaced QFN that I've stood on end. Um, and the big purple line at the top is a two millimeter reference line. And then these are all the individual measurements. Um, and you can see in the length column in the results, you know, I'm getting 100 to 150 microns. Um, so that's like four to six mil. So like promising, let's bundle it up and let's submit a talk and let's like see how it goes. Yay, <laughs> like, I guess this is what I'm doing for the next three months, this is great. Um, uh, so this is like the workshop I have in my apartment in Cambridge. Um, this is also like where I play my computer games. Um, so I wanted to like do this not in like the fab labs that I have access to, but like with minimal personal fabrication infrastructure. So I have, you know, a modern input shaping FDM 3D printer. I have about 15 square feet of shared apartment workspace. Um, basic tools, you know, I have a dial test indicator, multimeter calipers, like, you know, kind of the normal stuff. Um, but this is like a, an eBay project. Like this isn't a McMaster project, right? Um, so like it's gonna be fun. Uh, we're not really going to like do engineering work, so like we're not really going to like worry about forces and stuff. We're just going to make it like kind of squat and like stocky and like as stiff as we think it needs to be. And like let's just do it. Let's just rip it. Let's see if it works. You know. Um, so this is the little tiny machine that I built. Um, it's real cute. Um, and it's a four-axis machine, so it's got X, Y, Z Cartesian axes, um, and then it's got a spinny rotary axis, continuous rotation. Um, X and Y are on. Uh, MGN5, you know, five millimeter uh, rails um, driven by steppers and lead screws. Um, the z-axis is a flexure, like the, like the test ar article, um, with an overpressure, you know, knob to adjust the force. Um, and then a little servo that just lifts the axis up when it's not doing a cut. And then uh, the rotary axis is supported by thin section bearings. Um, and it's almost all 3D printed. You know, there's this one fabricated aluminum plate um, that I ordered from, from the internet. Um, but otherwise, it's all like, not only 3D printed, it's also 15% infill PLA. Like, it's not even like ASA or anything lovely like that. It's like just, just normal PLA. Um, designed around these little 40 by 40 millimeter coupons of FR4 that, that look like about that size. Um, and it's small. So, Zach, hold up the Pelican case. So, it's in here. Um, and that also has, this case is like atomic. So, other than a laptop, it's got everything you need to run the machine. So, it's got the substrates, it's got the cables, the controller, the power supply, like the tools to service the machine, sharpening, you know, all that other stuff. It's great, you might have seen it, I've been running it all weekend, it's fun. And it's a ripper, like a classic speed rhino, like it runs real fast. So this is like a, you know, a, a gel ballpoint pen, just running X and Y axes, um, just doing like a fast acceleration test. Um, and it works really well, so it's stiff enough to, to draw speed rhinos, of course. Um, I also got Rhino, which is like a fun program. NURBS are different, like it's, it's cool. Um, but it makes these nice renders. So you can see there's like, the machine has a hole and then it's got like the four parts that move relative to each other. So there's the, you know, the slidey, the slidey Z axis assembly with the flexure, there's the spindle, there's the bed, and then there's the frame. And those are also color coded. So frame is brown, you know, Z axis is gray, you know, Y axis is green, and then there's the spinny bit is kind of ivory colored. Um, results and limitations, because it's a prototype. Um, so 8.8 eight features are really solid, like you can do those pretty reliably. 6.6, um, six, six, you know, 150 micron traces and spaces are like marginal. You gotta really get it adjusted right. 
And like 4.4 is future work, so there's a path to it, but this is, this, this is not the machine that can do that. Um, and 20 to 50 millimeters a second, um, followed by a quick deburr with sandpaper. So it is faster than a milling machine by, by like about an order of magnitude. Um, I do a, a, a multimeter based continuity zero, and then I just do a manual pressure adjustment. So there's like a lot of you know, machine operator dependent uh, settings you have to do, but it, like it, you know, it works. It works when you need it to work. Um, and then there's like a whole myriad of interesting tool pathing challenges. So you can see these traces. You know, I cut this direction, but I didn't cut back this direction. So you can see like the like entrance where the, the cutter kind of like comes in and then goes flat. So I have to reverse and I have to like scoop that other little bit out so I don't get a short. Um, when the cutter rotates, it kind of turns into a drill. So that's a problem. <laughs> you know, that's a, that can be a problem. Um, and it just like eats SVG files, but like it really needs a proper design workflow. So there, you know, there's, there's, uh, there's a field of rabbit holes that you navigate in a, in a project like this. And like, it's my job to like put scaffolding down and like a little sign to like go back to this rabbit hole someday. Cause there's like, there's gold at the bottom of it, but like the goal is to like complete the spiral of the first machine. Um, let's see, uh, this board, the first one that I built, had 43 individual trenches, and of those, four of them had continuity to ground. So I had to like go back in with a loop and an Ulfa knife and just like scoop out a chip. It took a couple minutes. Um, so like 90% yield. You know, we'll accept it for a for a first run machine. Uh, and here's the first circuit again. Um, very simple. Like you can wave it around and like get a little persistence of vision thing. It's just a shift register and some LEDs. Um, it's seven because like, you know. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then eight is this, so it's not convenient. Um, so it's a, it's a seven instead of an eight, um, and it, it actually has a bodge. So like, I, I had to use that eighth pad and run a jumper wire over to there, um, but that's fine. Um, and this is my design workflows. Like I bring the uh, the footprints into KiCad, and then I just draw lines, and like that's where the trenches go, and yada yada yada. Um, and here it is making like a circle, like a spiral. It's fun. <laughs> um, a couple notes. Um, one is that it's going too fast to do full isolation routing right now. So like it's not cutting all the way through the copper. It's kind of smearing. Um, the second one is that this machine uses um, USB power delivery to like its maximum. So it pulls 100 watts. So like um, those, <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, 20 volts, 5 amps. Like let's go. Um, <laughs> um, so like these are these are like you know 50 millimeter long little slivers of gold plated copper you know and this is 100 watts right here on that on that header um, so you got to be careful uh, which I wasn't and I so you're either careful or you're lucky so I was I was lucky um, but it's fun I mean you can imagine using that to make for example planar magnetic coils at home because you want to do planar magnetic stuff um, there's all sorts of interesting reasons to use a machine like this. Um, a note on controls. Um, you know, this is a 20-minute talk, so like I'm focusing on mechanical stuff. Um, but the other, the other side of it is that my colleague uh, Jake Reed works on controls. You know, he's building this modular machine controller infrastructure as part of his PhD work. Um, and we had this like serendipitous meeting where, you know, I was building this mechanical contraption that needed some kind of controls, and like, yeah, you could like throw G code at it and yada yada. And Jake like was at the point in developing motion control and planning that he wanted to add a fourth axis. So like he needed a machine that had a spinny axis. And I was like, Jake, guess what? Like I can come back to the lab and like we can use the machine and like get it working. So like I went back on a Saturday a couple weeks ago and like we got the controls working. Um, and the previous generation of his work is called Modular Things. That's an open source project. It's a way of flexibly building like modular, you know, assemblable machine control systems. Um, the current generation, which is like these boards, um, he's still working on that. So like expect more information on that in a couple of months. Not really mine to share right now. Um, but it's all, you know, it's all an evolution of modular things. It all runs on his open systems assembly protocol, like things to Google. It's very interesting. Um, a couple tasty nuggets. Um, I use like little clamps, like little cam based clamps to hold the work in. So if you can control the size of the stock that you're using in your machine, you can do like really compact, clever work holding, which works really well, and like use little cone bearing, like cone pivots and stuff. It's very, it's very simple and elegant. Um, lead screw preloads, like there's a lot of ways to do it. I do it with more flexures, so I have like two nuts, and you tighten this one, and it compresses the flexure, and it like you know keeps keeps any play out of the machine while still keeping it very rigid. 
Um, so what's back, what, like, what's next? Um, I'm gonna like rest for a little bit, um, and then I'm gonna probably go back to working on flexury, like non-Cartesian, like weird machines. So like, stay tuned if you're interested in that. Um, big picture, like the circuit graver could be part of an ecosystem. Like you know, you grave, then you drill, then you put in vias, then you singulate, then you mask, then you pick in place, and like all this other stuff. You have a tool changer. You have like a, a fleet of tiny machines. Um, I, I think it's more interesting just as a little machine to like make breakout boards. Like let the let the supply chain do the rest of this. Like that's that's fine. Um, but really, the next steps for this machine are better understanding the chip production. Like better understanding the cutting forces involved. Um, understanding like why the cutter needs to be a certain rake angle. Like how much force you actually need. Um, the tip geometry. Like all the stuff that you need to study as a machinist to understand feeds and speeds. And I think you do that by building a stiffer machine, you instrument it with load cells, um, you understand cutting forces, tool wear, you know, you really quantify in minimum feature size, you figure out cutter geometry, try CVD diamonds, like do all those experiments, um, and then flush that through optimization and build another machine. Um, but in the meantime, like, it's all open source, so I'm sharing it under you know, the mechanical parts under a, a Creative Commons share-alike license. Um, yeah, so build one. Build one for yourself, build one for your friends. It's tedious to operate, but like, it does make circuit boards. Um, and then either like, ask Jake, or throw G-code at it for a couple months, or wait for him. Um, this is a cutaway of the spindle design. So it's got the thin section bearings, there's like a bearing cap, and like, I don't know. There's a lot, there's like a lot there, but you can read about it. Um, and then the resources, so, um, I've been documenting it on Hackaday.io since the summer. There's now 31 project logs. Um, I flipped them to be public this morning, so like, go to that website. You can read all about it, it's great. Um, more about me, uh, my portfolio site, zachfred.in. Um, more about Jake and his uh, you know, machine controllers and why he makes them and all that um, at his website, xyz.com. Um, his current and my former lab uh, Center for Bits and Atoms at MIT, cb.mit.edu. Oh, sorry, I'm talking too fast. Just give me a moment. Whew. <laughs> you guys are so wonderful. Like, <laughs> I, I love this place so much. I, I missed last year's conference, but I haven't missed one other than that. And like, this is, this is the happy place, you know? So uh, it, it's great to see so many friendly, familiar faces. Um, I just wanna, wanna say that as I'm catching my breath. Um, yeah, the CBA, it's like where I learned to build machines, it's where I learned why to build machines, it's an interesting place. Um, useful image analysis tool is ImageJ. Um, a place to buy sketchy linear motion components is eBay. <laughs> like, um, and I, also I apologize for like designing this machine around very expensive MGN5 rails. I use them because I found them on eBay, so like, I hope you can as well. Or just like use MGN9s. Um, and then I bought the brought the machine to the conference, so like, after lunch I'm gonna set it up uh, we can probably rip a couple more PCBs, get me an SVG file, like, can be art, can be a circuit board, whatever you want. Thank you.